All right, welcome to celebrating the 19th Amendment, Connecticut Women Leading in Public Service, a collaboration between Governor Jody Rell, Center for Public Service of the University of Hartford, and the Governor William O'Neill, Endowed Chair in Public Policy and Practical Politics of Central Connecticut State University. Good evening, everybody. I'm Jody Latina from News 8. I'm the senior political correspondent at the station, but tonight I'm going to be your volunteer guide on our virtual journey to do this celebration. And it's so nice to have everyone here this evening. I'm gonna introduce Greg Woodward. He is the president of the University of Hartford. Good, well, good evening. Thanks so much, uh, hi everybody. Thanks for joining us. Uh, looks like it's going to be a fabulous night. We have a terrific panel. Um, of esteemed guests, and we're honored to have uh, Governor Rell with us. And you know, her her name and support stands behind this entire enterprise at the Rell Center at the University of Hartford, and we're we're exceptionally proud of that, and so proud to be associated with her and with all the good guests we have here tonight. So thanks thanks again for being here. I I am I feel like a um, the kind of announcer at a uh, at a boxing match or a wrestling match. I'm supposed to say, get ready to rumble or something. But this isn't a debate. It is just a panel discussion. But in the interest of getting you riled up for the conversation that's about to take place, I'm just going to give you a couple numbers because I, I think they're amazing um, and, and stunning and upsetting. So um, I was looking at a report from a couple of years ago that the McKinsey Global Institute did on uh, gender equity in the United States. And let me, let me just tell you that six out of 10 of the indicators the McKinsey Group used for gender equity study um, re remained um, um, dangerous and, and had extremely high results of, um, of, of uh, the lack of gender equity in the United States. So here's a couple of, uh, of, of nuggets of, of facts. Um, the first uh, area in which they found concern was women in leadership and managerial positions. 66 women out of, out of for every 100 men exist in those positions. So 100 men in leadership and managerial positions in America, 66 women. The second fact is that women in America do almost double the unpaid care work that men do, double. So 66 leaders double the work that men do in, in care. The third biggest um, um, marker that they, that they um, talked about was violence against women. This is uh, an unbelievable thing I'm going about to say, and you probably know it, but um, in their study, there is an incident, of, uh, or an incident of sexual violence for every two women in America. We know that it's one in three for college students, one in, one in two. Um, the fourth indicator was that the US is one of the worst performing developed nations in the world on the representation of women in politics. Um, just crazy. And the fifth and sixth indicators are uh, two other important ones. One is single mothers and the other is teenage pregnancy, issues that often hold uh, women back from achieving their full economic potential. Um, one in four families in America is headed by a single mother living in poverty. Just let that sink in for a moment. One in four US families is headed by a single mother living in poverty. And uh, according to one study, the high teen birth rate is estimated to have cut, cost US taxpayers between nine and $28 billion a year in public assistance payments, lost tax revenue, and greater expenditures for healthcare, foster care, and criminal justice services. So folks, um, I don't know if that got you riled up or excited or depressed, but, but obviously we have a long way to go and a lot of work to do. And, and a panel like tonight is another good step in moving this agenda forward. So thanks to all of you for, for stepping in and stepping up. And uh, I turn it back to you, um, Jody, and um, uh, let's go on. Thanks so much. Thank you, President Woodward. Appreciate all of that, uh, that knowledge. Uh, CCSU's President Dr. Zulma Toro was unable to come tonight for unforeseen circumstances, but we do have Steve Klieger from CCSU to say a few words on her behalf. You're muted, Steve. There you go, Steve. Okay, thank you. I'm going to read Dr. Toro's opening remarks. Uh, good evening, I'm so happy to welcome you to today's panel discussion during the centennial year of women's suffrage. Considering we have just elected the country's first female vice president, the timing of this event could not be better. 
as we discuss the evolving role of women in Connecticut government, we could start to envision who our voters might one day send to the White House. Vice President-elect Harris's victory is particularly meaningful when you consider that in a country that is nearly 250 years old, women only gained the right to vote in the last 100 years. For women of color, it took nearly 50 more years to effectively exercise that right. Luckily, the women who fought for our right to vote and those that followed have made great efforts to make up for lost time, especially in Connecticut, where women achieved some important firsts in the nation. Among them is Ella T. Grasso, who was the first female governor of Connecticut and the first woman to be elected governor in the United States. More than 20 years went by before the second woman to hold that office was elected. And that, of course, is our host, Governor Jody Rell, whose leadership in the areas of ethics, state contracting, and campaign finance reform helped to recast Connecticut's identity after a difficult political period in the state. Governor, we are honored and very happy to have you with us this evening. Meanwhile, more women than ever before are serving in the Connecticut General Assembly. According to the Center for American Women in Politics, the number of female voters has exceeded the number of male voters in every presidential election since 1964. Nearly one million more women than men are registered to vote. The power of our voice and our vote is clear. There certainly is more work to be done to ensure women have equal representation in government. But as today's panel will demonstrate, we are making great strides to that end. I thank you all for sharing your stories and experiences with us. I am also very grateful to the organizers of this forum. The COVID-19 pandemic did not make it easy to coordinate an event on this scale. But fortunately for us, the determination of many members of our community won out in the end. <clears throat> I would like to thank, I would like to thank my colleague at the University of Hartford, President Woodward, for hosting and participating in this important conversation. We're also proud to say that CCSU and University of Hartford students have played a major role in planning this event. They also will pose questions to our panel later in the program. As more women choose to serve in government, we are hopeful that this forum will provide new insights <clears throat> into the historical obstacles and changing political environment that they have encountered in our state. There is much to discuss, so I won't keep you any longer. Welcome once again, and I hope you enjoy the evening. Thank you, Steve. It is my pleasure now to introduce Governor Jody Rowe. Good evening. I have unmute. There we go. Thank you, Jody. And thank you all the participants tonight, those who are joining us. We're really pleased that you could make it. And to our panelists that you will be introducing in a few minutes, Jody, I want to say thanks. I know how busy all of you are. So being a part of this event tonight is really very special. I want to take a few minutes to talk about the celebration, if you will, of the 100th anniversary of the women's right to vote, which is what really our focus is and has been a little bit mostly, I should say, this year. I had the occasion many years ago to serve as president of the National Foundation of Women Legislators. And it was quite an honor and a privilege at that time to meet a lovely lady from Connecticut who was among the first women of women to vote. And I said to her, as she was telling me a little bit about her story, I said, would you put it in writing and send it to me as a letter or something so that I could share it with other legislators around the nation? And she did. Her name is Harriet Clark, and she served uh, actually as a legislator from uh, Cornwall. <clears throat> Excuse me. And she shared her memories, which I want to share a little bit of those memories with you tonight. 
She said that a call went out to all of the women in the area. I'm sure that it was probably a, no a newspaper article or something of the like, that a date had been set to examine the candidates for the electorate. She said along with her mother, who was 62 years old at the time, and Harriet was 25, they went to the Cornwall Town Hall. And once they got there, they were asked to read a few lines from the Constitution. And she said, I'm sure they just wanted to make sure that we were literate. Can you imagine doing that today? We were then given the oath of office as a group. And she said, I believe we paid a poll tax. Maybe it was a dollar. We don't do that anymore either. She said, I looked around and I was surprised to see that the greatest number of participants there were elderly. I expected a lot of young people to be in there. She said also that when they took the oath of office and they were done, she said, I looked around and thought to myself, it's kind of quiet in here. I thought this would be a happy occasion. Instead, it was quiet, subdued. In fact, the look on the faces of so many women was very serious. And I quote her as saying, <clears throat> as I think back to that autumn day in 1920, I wonder if today's sophisticated 18 year old voters feel anything of the dedication and awe that we women in 1920 experienced. You know, if Harriet were alive today, I would love to tell her, we still have that awe and that dedication, but it's much more now than just the right to vote. It's the right to serve in any office, to run for any office, to get elected to any office, and to do good things for good people like in the state of Connecticut. So to all of our participants tonight, thank you for celebrating the 100th anniversary of the women's right to vote. Governor, thank you so much. That is a very inspiring story. What a great connection. That was good. I wanted to introduce our panelists now and ladies, thank you so much for taking the time tonight. Uh, Melissa McCaw, appointed by Governor Ned Lamont to serve as the Secretary of the Office of Policy as man and management, also known as the Connecticut Budget Chief. She was appointed in 2019. OPM is responsible for policy, planning, budgeting, and management of state government. Secretary McCaw has 18 years of budgeting, finance, operations, and planning experience in government and higher education organizations. He served three years as the Chief Financial Officer and the Director of Budget Management and Grants for Hartford where she led an intensive restructuring of Hartford's finances. She's worked as the budget director at the University of Hartford for nearly seven years and as a budget specialist in OPM for nearly eight years. Secretary McCall holds a Bachelor of Arts in Government from Wesleyan University and a Master of Public Administration with a concentration in public finance and budgeting from the University of Connecticut. She was born in Norwalk, raised in Waterbury and has lived in the state of Connecticut for her entire life. Brenda Kupcik was first elected first select woman of Fairfield, Connecticut in 2019. She is a former Republican member of the Connecticut House of Representatives representing the 132nd district from 2011 and to 2019. Kupcik has served as a member of the Fairfield representative town meeting from 1999 to 2003 and as a member of the Fairfield Board of Education from 2003 to 2009. She has also served as Chair of Public Health and Safety for Fairfield's Representative Town Meeting. She was a Constituent Services Representative for Congressman Christopher Shays from 2002 to 2008. And she's also served as Constituent Services Representative for Senator John McKinney. She graduated from Andrew Ward High School in 1983, and she went on to attend both Norwalk Community College and Fairfield University. Nancy Wyman, serving as the 108th Lieutenant Governor of Connecticut from 2011 to 2019, Wyman began her career in public service as Vice Chairperson of the Tallinn Board of Education. She served in this post for four years, but was on the board serving in other roles for an additional five years. And in 1986, she was elected as the state representative from the 53rd District of Connecticut. She served in this capacity from 1987 to 1995. She was state comptroller of Connecticut from 1995 to 2011, becoming the first woman elected to that office since it was created in 1786. 
Originally from Brooklyn, New York, she graduated with an associate's degree in radiological technology from Long Island College Hospital, and she is the former chairwoman of the Connecticut Democratic Party. Themis Claritus is the former Republican minority leader in the Connecticut House of Representatives. She is a former member of the Planning and Zoning Commission in Derby and a former member of the Board of Finance in Seymour. Claritus was elected to the House of Representatives as a Republican in 1998 from the 114th District. She has been reelected every term since. And she served as the Deputy Minority Leader from 2007 to 2014 when she was selected by the membership of her caucus to become the first female leader for the House Republicans effective in that 2015 session. Originally from Seymour, Connecticut, she graduated from Trinity College and Quinnipiac University School of Law. Ladies, so accomplished. It's wonderful to hear all those accolades and everyone has worked so extremely hard for them, so bravo. <laughs> we wanna start off by letting some of the panelists actually answer some of these great um, questions about maybe some obstacles you faced as a woman in your career, any milestones that propelled you, inspirations and mentors and changes that you may have witnessed in your time in government. Um, who would like to kick off? Maybe Melissa? Great. Well, good evening and uh, uh, such an incredible honor to be here today with Governor Rell, Lieutenant Governor Wyman, uh, Minority Le Leader Themis Claritas, and great to meet you, First Select Woman uh, Kupchik. Um, Obviously, to, we all know that we are amongst uh, a group of incredible women leaders that have um, set history here in the state of Connecticut. And I'm so delighted and honored to be here with you today. Um, also just want to acknowledge President Woodward. Um, I do still consider you heart as one of my homes and it's, it's great to be here with you this evening. Um, the 100th anniversary of women's suffrage, it's an incredible, opportunity um, for us as women leaders to reflect um, not only on the ability for us to vote, um, but as Governor Rell indicated, the ability to lead and to serve. And as I think about um, the incredible opportunity that I currently have to serve the state of Connecticut and Governor Lamont as, um, as the OPM secretary, I'm very thankful that I uh, am the first African-American woman OPM secretary. And as I think about um, some of the milestones and obstacles that I faced, because I do believe that as a part of that journey, uh, the milestones and the obstacles really help shape you for your growth as you propel in your career path. Um, one, of the, one of the things that really comes to mind is that I have found in this journey, um, one, that my career progressed very rapidly. Um, from OPM to UHART to Hartford and to the state. Um, but what came with that many times um, was that the environment that I was in, uh, typically I'd find that I was the only woman, I was the only black woman, and I was often the youngest. Um, and so when you are in those experiences and as women leaders, sometimes you have to uh, really be reflective on your internal self-talk. I found that it's very important to lean in on your competence and your strength. And I always rest assured that I'm competent as all hell <laughs> and I'm a firecracker, um, a woman leader. And so um, as you go through that journey, even if you are the first or one of the only um, not to let that shake your confidence because it actually, it makes you stronger. Um, some of the other things that have been incredibly helpful on the journey is I tend to take the tough assignments. I like, I like the challenge. And I think with challenge comes an opportunity for growth um, and um, strengthens you as a leader and helps to prepare you for, um, for the next opportunity. It's important to be comfortable in your own skin, know your talents, uh, your authenticity as a leader um, as, as you travel that journey. Some of the milestones um, in my career are the inspirations, um, my humble up, up, upbringing. I, I was raised by um, a single parent mother um, who is of British Jamaican descent. My grandparents emigrated here 
um, in the 1960s. And so uh, those values of work ethic and integrity really carry me through um, uh, on my journey, but also in the work that we do, because this is about public service. This is about um, shaping policy and programs and outcomes for the people of Connecticut. You take that lens with you as you're thinking about the, uh, the policy outcomes that you're, you're trying to achieve. When I think about folks that have inspired me, I think about Michelle Obama. Um, I think about Hillary Clinton. Um, and there's a quote that I always um, hold on to by the late uh, Martin Luther King. And I, I, I use that in the moments when it gets tough. And he said, if you can't fly, then run. If you can't run, then walk. If you can't walk, then crawl. But whatever you do, keep moving forward. And so these are some of the experiences or inspirations that have helped to shape me and continue to uh, push, push me forward in this, in this path of woman leadership. Secretary McCaw, thank you. And I would agree you are a firecracker, but a good one. <laughs> thank you. Thomas, would you like to pick up on that notion and talk about what has led you, what's moved you forward? I think you just need to unmute. Unmute. Sorry about that. I'm very particular about the muting thing. So sometimes I forget to unmute. Um, well, I certainly want to thank you, Jody, and Governor Rell, and Lieutenant Governor Wyman, and Melissa. Um, you know, it's 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 so exciting to be able to serve with other strong women leaders. You know, I think Melissa mentioned oftentimes being the only woman in the room, which of course, you know, unfortunately, Lieutenant Governor Wyman left, so she would be she and I would be the only two women in the room, and then she left me to be by myself, which I didn't forget her for that. Um, and, uh, you know, I was fortunate because I feel that for the majority of people that I serve with in the legislature as leaders um, were very respectful and treated everybody equally. There's always one or two that you know, think of you in a different way, even if, even if they don't obviously act that way. You can tell by the body language. You can tell by the um, the way they speak, the way they look at you know, certain people, men differently than they look at you. But, you know, I give all the credit for, for who I am and my leadership to my parents, because my grandfather and grandmother on both sides came to this country from Greece. And they came here, you know, from, as most of our parents or grandparents or great grandparents for that American dream. And they just fought really hard and worked really hard to raise a family and give them those opportunities that they all heard that we had here in America. And so my sister and I grew up with that understanding and understanding that, you know, whatever you do, we don't care what you do for your profession or for your community involvement, but just do something that you're passionate about. You know, and I didn't grow up in a political family. It was a business family. I didn't grow up in a legal family and I ended up in law school and then in politics. And then my sister um, ran for the house six years ago. So we're the only two sisters ever to serve in the Connecticut legislature, which has been a great opportunity for me. But I think, you know, Melissa made the point that, you know, your adversity and the struggles you go through, obviously, I think those really form who you are. And we all love it when it's easy. And sometimes we wish it was easier than it is. But you can, we can all look back on those struggles. I mean, and understand how that formed you, made you stronger, made you tougher, made you understand things better and maybe do things the same way the next time or maybe do things differently. I mean, when I ran the first time uh, for the house, you know, I was lit, I ran against a woman and she and her campaign did all sorts of obnoxious things to me all over the internet, all over the news, all over, you know, and everybody I'm sure remembers that, you know, and that was a woman to a woman and I don't, I don't think we as women should treat other women differently. I mean, I know we're supposed to empower each other. I think certainly everybody on this uh, on this meeting do that. But you know, the the implication was I wasn't. If you look a different way, you can't you can't be smart enough. You can't be competent. You can't be capable. You know, we have to. I think it's changed, but I think a lot of change needs to be had because we don't look at men that way. We don't look at men that dress a certain way or act a certain way or look a certain way as 
that being mutually exclusive, with being smart, with being competent, with being all of that. And I've just been very proud because for me in politics, I didn't really know much about politics at all when I ran the first time. And it was certainly a rude awakening, but I had many very, very good and um, compassionate and kind leaders and mentors before me. Um, so I try and do that as much as I can with other people. And I think that's something that's really important for us. I mean, a milestone for me was being the first woman House Republican leader. I'm so proud of that. Um, I'm so proud of the fact that for the past six years, and it seems that um, continuing on, I'm the only woman leader, Republican or Democrat in the entire legislature. Um, there will be no other women leaders for the next two years, at least, based on who was elected um, as leader. And I think it's important because there are days, I, I did a, a meeting a Zoom the other day with some younger girls from age six or seven to high school. And they said to me, what do you ever feel like uh, you don't want to do it anymore or you want to quit? I go every day at one point or the other, almost, I say, I don't want to do what I'm doing, whatever it is, whether it's politics or whether it's you know, my legal job or whatever it is, because we all know, and everybody on this call is saying to themselves, yes, you know, I understand what that feels like. Cause there are days when you say to yourself, is it worth it? Is it worth all the, you know, being under a microscope? Is it worth uh, all the, the abuse you get? Is it worth every question, every move you make people paying attention to? But I think we've all concluded at the end of every day that it is worth it because, you know, I don't consider myself a politician. I consider myself a public servant and I, if I believe in the way I was raised that I do, that no matter how much or how little money you make or where you went to school or where you live, you have to give back to your community in one way or the other. And I've been, that's what keeps me going every day. I would say that is a great life lesson, definitely giving back to the community. So thank you for those words. Uh, Lieutenant Governor Nancy Wyman, pick up on some of your experiences and why you, got into government and public service and, and what shaped your, your future? What future? I'm old, no future. So thank you so much, Jody. And thank you, uh, Jody Ralph, for your leadership and your friendship over these years. Uh, it really has meant a lot to me. Uh, I think on the screen, I am the oldest person. Uh, it's not because I dye my hair that color. It just happened that way. I. I you know, I, I was very, very fortunate. I had no idea anything about politics. I was an x-ray technician when I started out and I got involved um, in my local politics. I didn't like the um, people that were running the Board of Education. And for many of you that might not know, I am a Democrat and the people that were running the Board of Education in my town were Democrats, so it wasn't a a party thing. And uh, I never knew anything about politics, to be honest with you. I, um, My mom would take me, because I came from Brooklyn, she would take me to go vote and she would let me stand outside the curtain. I know a lot of you are too young, you don't remember that you had a, uh, there's a curtain and you go inside it. And um, she would say, stand out there. And I, and I would go out with her and I'd say, Ma, who did you vote for? And she would say, when you get old enough to know, then you'll make those decisions. That's why there's a curtain there. And I said, okay. So I had no idea when I was, uh, 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 I think it was like uh, uh, 30 years old. Uh, I don't wanna say that because uh, my, my kids were in, 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 in school here in Tolland and um, I didn't like what was going on in the school system. So somebody said, hey, come to a caucus. And I have to be honest with you, I didn't know what a caucus was. And so I said to my husband, what's a caucus? He says, whatever you do, don't scratch your nose because you're gonna get into it. And I went, really? And I said, I had no idea. And uh, at, he was right. I didn't scratch my nose, but ended up uh, running for the Board of Education in Tolland. And, uh, because I didn't like what was going on there and and ran against uh, at, the, at the caucus, I, I beat the incumbent Democrat that, uh, and I, I just did it. I, I didn't do it on purpose, but she wasn't doing the kind of job that I thought was doing right. 
so I ended up uh, the Board of Education and then um, and uh, really enjoyed that. But then also got a job because I hurt my back as an, as I told you, x-ray technician and ended up working in the House Democrats. And then the next thing I knew, um, the, uh, the, the uh, state representative from my district said, hey, Nance, could you just put your name in? Because I'm going to run for the state Senate, I think. And so in case I don't, you can then run. And I went, I don't want to be a state rep. But I just like working for the caucus. And he said, don't worry about it. You don't have anything to worry about. Well, he lied because um, he ended up not running for anything and or Senate or House. And I got involved running for the House. Um, that's when I had the privilege and honor of working with Jody Rell. And, and it, it was truly is a privilege and honor of knowing Jody. And as all of you know, we are of different parties. But uh, so I get elected uh, one term after Jody. And uh, this man comes over to me and says to me, hey, you know, uh, Governor O'Neill thinks uh, we want to get you to go someplace and he wants you to do things. Because they didn't know if I was good or bad for them. And I said, what is it? And he says, well, it's for young um, uh, elected officials to go to this thing in Washington, D.C. And I said, what do you mean by young? And he said, well, you have to be under 40. I said, when are you, when are you turning it in? And he said, oh, about, uh, I said, if you don't do it by April, I'm not into it, the young stuff. And so it ended up, Jody and I and TJ Casey ended up going to uh, Washington, D.C. And the person I ended up having lunch with, because Jody blew us off, was TJ and a guy named John Rowland. And um, so I, 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 I led on from then, ended up because of very special people putting me to the head as, as uh, chairman of the education committee. And, and there was two women that helped me get there and that's uh, 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 Naomi Cohn and Janet Polinsky that said to a guy that was a, the, uh, uh, the head of the, the Democratic Party in, in the House, he, they, Balducci, Rich Balducci, and they said, we're not moving up unless you put Nancy up into a bit different place. So I ended up being chairman of the Education Committee and, um, and then uh, I'm running to other places. The one thing I learned from everybody as I went through this whole process and, and Jody and I got to serve for a long time together is if your word is not your bond, you're not a very good leader. You can't be a good person for the rest of the people that you have elected you. I don't care, Democrat, Republican, it is, it is that your word is your bond. And so I've been very fortunate and my entire life um, of taking on positions that never have been taken on by women, but I think I won those because my voice was deeper than the men. Um, and that there's only one man that was running at the same time and he was running for secretary of state. And every time we go around the state as Democrats, they'd say, oh, the next um, as secretary of state. And they go, Nancy Wyman. And poor Miles Rappaport would like kind of look and say, what do I do? And I said, you sit. I get up. I said, he doesn't look like a Nancy. I am. The difference is my voice is deeper than his. So I just want to tell all of you, just please talk to all of our young women and men. We need them and we really truly need them in running for politics, giving their word out, fighting for what they believe in, and so I, I, I thank you again, Jody Rell, for inviting me, my dear friend. Um, uh, I, I truly think that this is so important if we can kind of spread the word to all women and young men. Uh, it is, we will make this world a better place. Thank you. Thanks, Jody.
Thank you. That was very nice. And it is true. Your your word is definitely your bond and that networking essentially helped you get to where you are today. And that's it's really a, a tool that everyone can learn from. Um, for Select Woman Cup Chick, if you could pick up on some of what Nancy was talking about and tell us about your experiences, um, you too started um, not where you ended up. <laughs> no. <laughs> So I just want to first say uh, it's a pleasure to be here and I appreciate the invitation, Jody. And it's really an honor to be on this panel with some of the women that I admire. Um, as Melissa was saying, she admires uh, specific women, but two of the women uh, uh, here tonight I have admired for my entire uh, career is uh, Governor Rell and Themis Claritus, uh, two strong, really vibrant, smart, and unafraid women who, I, who, I've, who I've watched and tried to emulate over my many years um, in public service. I think you have to, uh, as a leader, I think we all, um, as women, uh, have to be strong when we need to be, but I think our greatest strength is our compassion and uh, to the ability to feel, uh, genuinely feel how other people feel. And so on this anniversary of 100 years, you know, thinking about being a woman and what it's like to be a leader. And as uh, uh, Themis has said, and Melissa, you know, your heritage, you know, has, a, has an impact on you. So I, I think I had a little different experience. I grew up in a very big Italian family. My grandmother had 15 children, 13 boys, two girls, and the majority of the people in our family were male. And so we grew up with a lot of male cousins and, and family members. So I never realized that I was anything but equal because no one ever treated me any different uh, growing up. We were all there together and fighting in a family, you know, to, to get our space and to make, uh, to make our mark. Uh, I think honestly in, in, in politics, I never, I never in my life expected to be elected to any office ever. Never had any aspirations to be elected to any offices. I started a business with my husband over 30 years ago. And I, like, uh, like former Lieutenant Governor Wyman, was uh, frustrated with the Board of Education in my town. And I didn't care what their party affiliation was. I just thought they were obnoxious. And uh, I thought, well, this is inappropriate and somebody should do something about it. And when I said that to people, they said, well, why don't you do something about it? And so I'm like, well, what can I do? And so I started a group called One Voice for Education and it was made up of Democrats and Republicans and it didn't matter to me at the time. Uh, and we went to meetings, we wrote letters to the editor and we called everybody and no one really was listening to us. So I finally said to everyone, um, after about a year that some, some of us actually have to run for office or we're not gonna ever be listened to. And you know how you ever see that, you know, that line where everyone's standing there and they said, who wants, to, who wants to step up and everyone steps back and you're kind of like standing there. So there was like a, like a half a dozen, dozen of us who uh, ran for local office. And, you know, we did a lot of great things. Uh, we changed the landscape in our town. We were more civil and we were listening and more proactive and, it wasn't just Republicans, it was Democrats and Republicans. When actually Democrats and Republicans worked together, it was really unique. <laughs> and hopefully someday we can get back to that sort of thing. Um, but we worked really hard uh, together and we fought for things we cared about, education issues and civility. And I served on the Board of Education for six years and someone said, hey, why don't you run for state representative? You'd be really good. And I was like, I don't really wanna do that. And when I served in the legislature, and I have to say, uh, and I'm sure uh, uh, Governor Rell and Lieutenant Governor Wyman and Themis can say that serving in the legislature was probably one of the most significant experiences that I've ever had in my entire life. Uh, I learned so much serving in that body and, and the relationships that I made. And as uh, Governor, uh, for, former Lieutenant Governor Wyman said, your, your word is your bond. And when you have uh, honesty and integrity in your heart, you can make things happen in the legislature. And so I never felt there was any sort of um, uh, male chauvinism <laughs> in the legislature. I, I mean, yes, as Themis mentioned, there are some people who treat you a little different, but for the most part, 
Um, it was really issue based and we fought hard for issues we cared about. And it was more about arguing against issues than man or woman. But I have to say, uh, being elected to this position uh, as first select woman and second woman in Fairfield's 380 year history to serve in this role, which I am extraordinarily proud of. Uh, I grew up in, in Fairfield. I'm a third generation Fairfielder and I'm very proud to leave my town. But I think for the first time in my 55 years, uh, I have really experienced what it's like um, to uh, see male chauvinism in a real way. And I think uh, when you're in a top position and Governor Rell can probably speak a little bit about this um, and as can uh, Themis, uh, when you're in a leadership top position, there is a uh, real change sometimes in some people's behavior toward you as a leader. Uh, and, and that's a difficult thing. I've been in this position for one year now and um, it's uh, something I, I continue to um, struggle with and, and get frustrated about because uh, it, it, it's, it's sort of unexpected uh, that people that you've known for a long time uh, treat you a little differently now because you are uh, the leader, uh, the buck stops at your desk and you're making these decisions. And so I think we still have some, some work to do as women. Uh, to, to uh, raise our young boys, <laughs> to make sure that they uh, are looking at women and, and maybe in a much more uh, balanced way, but there is still work to do. And I, I feel it very greatly that women uh, leaders have a different experience, I think, than men do. And so I think we have to work that much harder to get things done, I think, than men do in these positions. So. That is something I think we should be talking about because I, I'm still I'm still actually a little shocked by it um, even today in, in my at my 55 year old self, but uh, it's a really honor to be with here with all of you and I, I I really admire all of your work and your effort and I admire all the women who work really hard uh, for public service and as them has said you know it's not a it's not always a comfortable thing to go out and fight for things you believe in and you know it's so much easier to just run a business or work a job where you're not in the uh, limelight, where people aren't constantly scrutinizing every move you make and questioning you. Uh, but there are so many rewards uh, involved with public service, being able to do real things uh, that make a, an honest difference in the life of people. And that is something that is, um, is immeasurable. And so that's why I think all of us do what we do or why we fight so hard for the things we believe in. Thank you so much, Brenda. And it is true. I mean, this conversation will hopefully help um, maybe educate some men. Uh, these are tough roles that ladies take on and, and respect is definitely warranted. So we're gonna start off with some of our questions from our students and up first to kick us off tonight is Benny Quartang. She is a sophomore. Benny, go ahead and ask your question. Um, and I think we'll direct this first question maybe to Representative Clarity. Hi, uh, thank you so much. Uh, my name is Benny Quartang. Uh, I'm a sophomore at the University of Hartford pursuing a double degree in international studies, government and politics with a minor in French. Uh, so my question to the panel is, uh, one of the barriers that contributes to the underrepresentation of women in government is a societal tendency to equate masculinity with leadership traits. According to data from a 2018 survey conducted by Pew Research Center, more people say being assertive, decisive, and ambitious help men get high political office positions, while women gain more of an advantage from being approachable, physically attractive, and compassionate. So as women working in public offices, tell us about your experience navigating through a political career despite these gender-based expectations. Thank you. Well, I think that's a great question. Uh, thank you because you know I have this discussion probably weekly because when you use those words that you just did, assertive and you know, I don't remember the other one. Assertive was the first one that came to mind, but you know, any of those adjectives, assertive, strong. Uh, taking the initiative. Those are such great qualities when you describe a man that, that explains and describes the man as strong and tough and a leader and, and competent. But unfortunately, oftentimes when you want to say that about a woman, they use other words. 
okay? They often use the word that begins with a B. And we've all heard that more than once in our, in our lives. Now, I think Brenda brought the point uh, up when she spoke that women have a different way of dealing with things and a different approach. And that compassion and that kind of thing certainly is important. But I think the best of us are able to combine those two, that being assertive and being strong and quite frankly, not taking any crap from anybody because that's part of the problem. I think most men will just tell you where to go if you don't agree with them or you're giving them a hard time. But a woman will get nervous and anxious and then they'll back down and, you know, and anybody, you don't know me, but anybody who knows me knows that that just turns me more in the other direction. Um, you know, I will go right at you and I will not stop until, you know, my point is made and I get where I want to get or make you suffer along the way until even if I don't get there. But, you know, interestingly, one of the, one of the traits you just brought up was attractiveness in women. And when, if you go back 22 years, when I first ran the first time I had done um, swimsuit modeling and, and fitness modeling in and fitness contests in between going to law school and running for office. And my opponent, again, who was a woman and her team, they put all sorts of things up on the internet and um, in mailers about how that's all I was. It would say, you know, swimsuit model. And then her, it was all of her accolades, every board she was on, forgetting the fact that I was a lawyer, forgetting the fact, you know, that I can actually speak in public and can put a thought together. Um, and that's what I think part of the problem is because if I were a man, right, they would talk about, oh, he's in good shape or he's attractive and he's smart. That's like the whole package, but with a woman, we focus on how they look. So I will just say this to you. Anybody who tells you who you think is treating you differently because you're a woman, you just go back at them harder. Like the only way we're going to stop this is by standing up for ourselves and, you know, Brenda mentioned it because I was leader for six years and she was one of my, you know, most amazing um, members of our caucus. But you just can't take crap from people. You can't. Um, I know that certain times you, you have to know when to be softer, you know, and be more of a mediator of a group or, or you know, try and get people together. But that's part of the skill set we all have to have to be leaders of anything, you know, whether you're the governor or, or lieutenant governor or state representative or for selectmen or you know, OPM secretary, part, that's part of our everyday job to try and come to a solution that everybody can live with and, and that's positive. But you know, the only way we stop this guys is by standing up to the people that are putting, trying to put us in that box. And you know, hopefully by the time you know, you're out there, um, it, every year it gets better and better, but it will not get better unless every single one of us in those positions says no more. You know, you're not going to look at me differently. You're not going to treat me differently. You're not going to talk to me differently. And I'm not going to stop if I believe something is the right thing to do. Representative, thank you very much. Uh, Mackenzie Gould is a senior and her question is coming up next. Mackenzie, why don't we direct this one to uh, Lieutenant Governor Wyman? Good evening, everyone. My name is Mackenzie Gould. I'm a senior at Central Connecticut State University and I am majoring in social work and minoring in psychology. So a 2016 report from the Bureau of Justice indicates that just 12% of full-time sworn police officers, 10% of supervisors, and 3% of police chiefs are women. Some have advocated for more substantial increases in the number of women in all levels of policing. What is your view on the role of women in policing, particularly in the view of the current police reform movement? Uh, you need to unmute. I got it. There you go. <laughs> Thank you, Mackenzie. I appreciate that, that question. And the interesting part to me be honest with you is uh, I, I'll, I'll bring it back to the years that I've been in uh, in uh, like a, a I guess the elected official that that was either a, uh, a state uh, controller or dealing with any of the truthfully any any of the governors that um, if when I first started out as a state rep uh, we didn't have females in that position as a state, uh, as a, the, the state police in the higher up places. We had very, very few. And I will even say, even when I was Lieutenant Governor, 
um, there were not a lot of female um, uh, state troopers. In this past administration, I've seen more and more female state troopers. The, 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 the truth is that a lot of it is, it is very, very difficult to achieve that goal as a state trooper. They work, women have to work three times harder, I think, and that's not right, but that's what we're seeing happening. We have now seen, truly, I, I've seen more state troopers uh, graduating to as, as troopers, I'm sorry, a lot more women than I've ever seen before. And so finally, we are start, starting to see, uh, in my opinion, um, the, the increase in female state troopers taking care of male governors or female lieutenant governors um, or anything else. I, and Jody probably can answer that better than I can about who is on her, her troop team. Uh, but I will tell you that I never saw it under any of the other governors um, that I've seen before. I think we need to have women understand that they are as good in protecting people and going after people than any male can do. And it is a hard job to get to that title. Harder than, you know, and, and with all due respect, harder than even me getting to a state controller, uh, even though I was the first state controller. So that's because my voice was deeper, I got it. But, um, but it, the truth is, is that um, we're seeing more and more, and we need to see more and more women in that field. The, the compassion, and the strength that these women have is unbelievable. But we just don't get that word out yet. So Mackenzie, if you wanna become a state trooper, just let me know. And I have some friends still there and I would love to write you a recommendation. And thank you for even asking the question. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Lieutenant Governor. And there is, um, and there are several actually female um, security members of Governor Lamont's team. So that is a nice change to see. So it is happening. Um, the next question is gonna be from Elena Washington. She is a senior. And Elena, why don't we ask your question to Melissa? Hi everyone, my name is Elena Washington. I am a senior at the University of Hartford studying politics and government and minoring in paralegal studies and photography. So my question is, despite the number of obstacles preventing women from being represented in government and politics today, over time, the US has seen modest increases in representation in most levels of government. Today, about one third of state legislators in Connecticut are women. Nationally, about 29% of state legislators are made up of women and about 24% of US House of Representatives and senators are women. What can we do to accelerate the pace of gender parity in state and federal governments? Very good, thank you, Elena, and a pleasure to meet you. Um, so clearly we've made some progress with some of the stats that, the stats that you've provided. We're at the 30% mark in our, in our state legislator representation here in Connecticut. Um, I think some of the work begins with, uh, in terms of our Dedication to service, there's also a need to dedicate to cultivating leaders at a local level and, um, and, and one modeling before them the opportunities to lead in these types of positions. Um, but also I would say um, that whether it's um, an elected official within state government or it's our state agencies, that there has to continue to be a greater commitment to achieving parity um, in terms of the workforce. Um, we know that you know, the decisions that are made within state government, that's important to have um, broad perspective at the table. Um, and so employers have to begin to make that a priority. When you think about um, even in the private sector setting, board seats and decisions that are made on representation amongst boards and, and those types of decisions, uh, achieving parity in those settings as well um, has to become a commitment. Um, in fact, one of the uh, 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 
councils that Governor Lamont and Lieutenant Governor Beiswitz have led on is the Council on Women and Girls that focuses specifically on this goal of achieving gender parity, uh, not only in state government, but even you know, throughout the state of Connecticut. And so we have made, uh, worked with a lot of corporations and businesses to also join forces um, with this particular, particular goal. Um, but I also have to say as, um, as a woman leader and as a mother, that it's important that um, even at a young age that we begin to nurture the ideas in our young girls about leadership roles, that they need to see us in these leadership roles so that as they grow up, they, and in their mind, they see that as achievable. Um, and that even goes to um, professions that tend to be male dominated. And so you see there's a heavy push to um, expose uh, girls to STEM uh, professions. So, um, you know, as, as we think about how to change this dynamic, I do think it's uh, continuing to model um, leadership. It's continuing to be a part of the solution in our communities to cultivate leaders and really begin to work with our young uh, girl, uh, girl leaders because they are truly going to be the leaders of the future, that are the, they're the next generation, and that we have to continue to um, exemplify that uh, throughout our leadership and make that a priority. So I think it's that there's a multifaceted approach. We're seeing progress, you know, as our young girls are now seeing the first African-American woman vice president. Again, these are, um, um, th that will mark them, that marks in their mind of the what is possible, right? And so the more that uh, people begin to see what women leaders can do, um, I think that we'll continue to see more growth and more progress. Um, and so that certainly there's, there's more work to be done, um, but um, I think the opportunity is there to do so. Great, Melissa, thank you very much. Um, and it is good to emulate to, to our young children because that's how they learn. Um, so Janae, you are up next, you're a junior. Janae Winter, why don't you ask your question over to First Select Woman Kupchik. Hi, I'm Janae Winter. I'm a junior at CCSU studying sociology with a minor in writing and publishing. Um, and my question is, um, many observers say that among others, women are experiencing a disproportionately large and adverse effect from the pandemic. Um, impacts range from higher levels of unemployment in some industries to childcare challenges, increases in domestic violence and healthcare um, service disruptions. As women in leadership positions, how do you think state government should attempt to mitigate these impacts? Well, thank you, Janae, and I appreciate you being here tonight. So, um, yeah, I tried to, I actually did a, um, a government badge with some uh, fourth and fifth grade brownies late this afternoon before I came home, and they came to visit town hall, and they were asking questions about government, and I was trying to explain to them the difference between town government, state government, and their little kids, and, and our federal government, and how they all sort of mirror each other, and the different things they do. So the state government, when I, when I need assistance to help a resident in my town, especially during this pandemic, that if they need a state assistance or if they need town assistance. But yes, I, I mean, leading a town during a pandemic has been uh, probably one of the most difficult challenges I've ever faced in my entire life. Uh, I am intimately seeing uh, real struggles in my community through all the things that you just mentioned, uh, people having a really difficult time, most notably women, uh, especially single women and elderly as well uh, with this situation. It's, it's, it's awful and difficult for people who are already vulnerable and people who become vulnerable because of this situation. Uh, towns like mine have stepped up dramatically. We have uh, implemented a lot of additional social services. We've implemented a COVID-19 relief fund that has raised a significant amount of money to help families with things like that or single mothers, things like that, to help them pay rent, utilities, all these different things and additional uh, services through the Center of uh, Family Justice, uh, domestic violence. There are increased uh, fatigue across all barriers not just women, but men as well. And uh, I think that this is probably arguably uh, one of the most challenging times for many of our residents, not just in my hometown here, but across our state. 
And so I think the state is uh, doing their best. And I think we all need to be cognizant of being particularly uh, cautious and careful looking for these people in our, in our community who need this additional assistance because of the pandemic. It's very difficult for people. It's trying and it's wearing on everyone. And the people who have the most difficult times who are already vulnerable, it's having a huge impact. So it's something we all need to be looking at really closely and be cognizant and be there to help when we're needed. Thank you so much for Select Woman Kupchik. It is a very trying time. Um, we're gonna take some questions that have been coming into us as we're, as we're uh, enjoying this panel discussion. Um, Kim Healy writes in and she wants to know what initiatives would help get more women elected at the state level in Connecticut? Um, making sure that there's fair representation of all parties. Um, anyone wanna tackle that question? Any initiatives that you think might help get ladies um, elected to state office? Lieutenant Governor Wyman. I, I, you know what, I, I just think we have to change the way we teach in schools and how we as mothers talk about um, what young women can do and what they should be able to do um, to learn to speak out for what they really believe in. And I do think it has to come from um, family and within the school systems of talking about young women can get to do anything they want to do if they want to do it. There is no, in my opinion, there is no blockage of what you want to do anymore. We can do whatever we need to do as women, young or old, um, and I'll be honest with that one, I'm the old one, but we have to push women or young, young women to understand that their word is very, very important. Their feelings are very, very important. And you know what? You know, I can wear slacks just like men anytime. And, you know, I can speak lower than they can anytime. And I'm just saying, I have to teach them and my grandchildren and, and your children and grandchildren, whoever has, is that women can do whatever they want to do, be them police officers, Mackenzie, or becoming, uh, you know, a governor like Jody Rell. Yeah, you can do anything you want to do if you put your mind and your heart to it. And that there is no restrictions. If we fight like hell, speak like we should speak with our word as our bond and get out there and do the right thing, we can win it all. Jody, can I, can I comment? Yes, because I was actually gonna say, um, you know, you made this point earlier that of the big six leaders in the legislature, none of them are women. So what can we do to foster even from the inside that, that confidence in electing a female leader? And I think it's a couple things. I think first it's, I mean, in no particular order, you know, all of the women on this, on this call right now and every other woman we know, I think it's so important that we go into whether it's kindergarten classes, fifth grade classes, high school classes, because when young women see us, I'm sorry, it's different than when they see an, an older guy. You know, it's different. They want to see people that look like them and, and feel like them and, and think like them. So they believe that they can do it. Now, I think Lieutenant Governor is going to remember this. We were on a panel a few years ago at the University of New Haven. And I just don't remember if she said it or somebody else who were on the panel has said it. But I've been using it ever since then because I think it's, it's the best thing I've ever heard. When, when if there's a man and a woman, and this is changing a little bit every day. So, I mean, we were very happy for that, but we still have a way to go. If a man and a woman are standing there and somebody says to the, to the woman, you know, you should really run for office, whatever, with mayor, first selectman, a board of ed, whatever it is, the woman will start to figure out every excuse as to why they may not be able to do it. Oh, I don't know what it, what it takes. I don't know what it entails. How much time is it going to take? Do I, know, do I know the issues? I don't know the issues. What about my family? What about my job? There'll be 10,000 reasons 
why they might not be able to do it. If you ask the man standing next to her the same question, he'll look right back at you and say, yeah, I think I should. Now that's, that is generational, that's societal, and that is certainly changing. But I think one of the more important things we can do, as I said, I think it's incumbent upon us as leaders and people involved in government to go into those schools, to go into those community centers, to go into those sporting places, you know, for, with teams and organizations and to have those conversations. So women look at you and say, hey, she's, she looks like me. She, can, she did it. I can do it. Also, I think it's really important to raise your boys the same way you raise your girls, right? For young boys now to understand that that girl in my kindergarten class is my equal, right? We're the same thing. I'm not better than her. I'm not worse than her. We can do, apply for the same jobs. We can get the same jobs. We can go to the same schools. And, you know, teaching young boys that is what's going to change this just as much in the future as, as teaching young girls that, you know, and I, women always talk about their mom as their role model. And my mom certainly is the strongest woman I know, but I will tell you this, my dad coming from, you know, an old school kind of Greek family, he only had brothers and all his brothers had all girls. And my dad, from the moment I remember being un able to understand what he was saying, always made my sister and I feel that you could do whatever you want, whenever you want, however you want. There was no, I never had a thought in my mind from my mother or my father that we couldn't do whatever we wanted to do, you know, and that's why we were raised believing that because that's what our parents taught us, you know, so I think it's so important to learn that at home and teach young boys about that too, because who are the people that are being discriminatory at, at, at all of our age? Men. I mean, they learned it somewhere. You know, and I think at every, whether it's growing up, going to school, you know, as Nancy mentioned, teaching in schools, I mean, it needs to be taught all along the way. Thank you for that. Um, Brenda, can you pick up a little bit on some of what was talked about? I know that um, getting into public office really takes a lot of courage too, because you are putting yourself out there. I think there's a common thread among all the ladies talking about where they are in their, in their careers. And Putting yourself out there can be really scary and pick up on just that notion of how do you convince some of these young ladies tonight um, that it's okay, that you might not know the answer to everything, but that you'll learn it. So, um, well, I would, uh, well, I would pivot to say, um, I know we're having a women's forum, but I, I think we just need good, balanced, honest people running for office. <laughs> um, to be perfectly honest, uh, I, I love the uh, notion of having more women, but I, I personally look at it more like I just want good bipartisanship and integrity and common sense. And I don't care if you're a man or a woman. I just want people to behave <laughs> in an appropriate way. And frankly, um, I don't want to focus so much. I look at our legislature now and um, I, I think it's, um, I think it, it, when I served there, I thought it was much better when the numbers were closer and we had a balanced approach and bipartisan budgets, uh, things of that nature. I think that's good for everybody. Uh, I tell people that all the time, you know, you might be a Republican or a Democrat, but, uh, you know, good government comes when there's, uh, when there's bipartisanship and that only happens when numbers are really close. And I, I encourage women and young men who have true sense of, of love of service uh, to, to, to put themselves out there. Um, then this is right. Uh, men always feel a little bit more confident about achieving things. Uh, we, we do that maturation, you know, we all did it. We all do it as women. Uh, am I good enough? Can I do it? Can I manage it? How am I gonna do this? Because we, I think we put a higher expectation on ourselves um, than probably men do. We want to be really good at what we say we're gonna do. I know I do and I think that the women on this panel probably feel the same way. We hold ourselves to a bit of a higher standard and we want to be very good and we don't wanna let anyone down. I think that's the biggest thing, right? But um, I wanna encourage young women or all age women to run for office. But honestly, I just want good people running for office, <laughs> good, honest people. 
Thank you for select woman. Uh, Melissa, maybe you can um, kind of pick up the conversation there. Um, encouraging the bipartisanship, obviously it makes your job as secretary of OPM a lot easier to handle when there is that consensus in the room. Is there anything that you see from your perspective in your leadership role that, that can help foster some of that? I do. I mean, I, at the end of the day, when you get back to the core of why um, legislators put their hand up and say, I want to serve, it's to represent uh, the people. And I have to say that in the, my current role, I've gained a greater appreciation for that um, and the diversity of thought. But at the end of the day, that there are interests that they're representing. And those interests, when they align, are setting a vision for the state of Connecticut what our priorities are, the quality of life that we wanna achieve for our citizens, citizenry, the goals we wanna achieve in education, what we wanna see in housing, you know, the economy that we wanna have here in, in the state of Connecticut. And, um, and if we're going to ser truly serve the people, then that means both all parties' voices have to be heard. Um, and so um, we know that politics can be sticky and it's more art than science. But if we're if we're thinking about the core of why we're all here for public service, then it does mean that you know the voices have to, all voices have to have to be at the table. Um, so you know that's when we get back to leadership and how we cultivate that um, in the in the community, then that means as we're working with our future leaders, it's making them understand that despite your views, whatever your views are that you have to speak up and let your voice be heard and, and serve in some capacity. And I agree wholeheartedly with, um, with what, uh, Themis, what you, what you said. I think it's so important that we be authentic and we keep it real. Um, when we, we keep it real, not only in our professional role and, and our perspectives that we bring to the table, but even as we engage with the young people, um, because sometimes they look at us and they put us on a pedestal and it seems like the path to get there is so very difficult. But when you break it down and, you, and you're very transparent with them about the little steps along the way, it's the incremental steps along the way that um, help you to, to achieve these heights. I think that transparency and making yourself seem approachable and the task attainable is very important. Um, and so um, I think you can take that at the local level when you're, when you're working with youth and you can take it to the capital um, that the voices should be heard because at the end of the day, it's about, it's about serving the people of the state of Connecticut. Thank you, Secretary. Um, Themis, can you talk a little bit about that? Um, the REL Center is obviously um, has a mission of civil discourse. How does that um, get promoted at those higher levels when you are dealing with so many people in the room? And as you know, it can get hot. It can get very hot. And you know, we all have different personalities. We all come at things from a different angle. We all have different ways of, you know, you have the passive aggressive people, then you have the aggressive people, you know, I kind of feel like I'm both depending on like the circumstance and who I'm dealing with. Um, and so I think sometimes we confuse being hot and passionate about your issue and, you know, and fighting for what you believe in with not having civil discourse. I mean, I think everybody on this, on this Zoom knows where the line is, right? It's, it's like the Supreme Court definition of pornography you know when you see it well like we know I you know when you're feeling somebody stepped over the line you know and I've certainly been in in situations like that I think we all have been but I think from from our perspective I mean whether it's whether it's a you know a town clerk or board of ed or a first selectman or a legislator or governor I think it's it's our obligation on all of our parts you know it's it's top down bottom up I mean it's everybody kind of has to be that way. I mean, we all know when name calling is name calling, and it's not just one of us being tough on an issue. We know the difference. I mean, you know it, you feel it, you see it. And, um, you know, I agree with Brenda, you know, whether it's male or female or Republican or Democrat, I mean, we all pick the side we pick, right? That's, that's what the democratic process is about. And I think it, it's a wonderful process, but we're going to get into arguments. We're going to not talk to each other for a while. We're going to fight at certain times. We're, we're going to believe that there are people that you know, their word isn't their bond, and then you treat them accordingly going forward. But it's just about kind of, for me, common sense and treating people the way you want to be treated. If you're, treat, if you're dealing with me in a respectful way, I, I respect that you don't agree with my position. I respect that you're gonna go to the mat for yours. 
but give me the same, you know, the same courtesy. And, you know, we, we should all stay on that level. Thank you. Uh, Nancy, tell me a little bit about your experience. Um, it's different when you are the only woman in the room and you presided over the Senate for quite some time in your role as Lieutenant Governor. Um, and I don't believe there were any female senators at the time and maybe toward the end, Senator Boucher, but toward the oh, beginning no. there, um, yeah, you were the, the there only were, I mean, really, There was a, a few, to be honest with you, but I, I guess I wanna go back to what Themis was talking about. First of all, congratulations Themis on, on uh, being married just recently. Thank uh, you. It's, it's great to see that. Um, and he's a great man. Um, even though he's Republican, but it's okay. I don't mind. Um, <laughs> he says but, the same about you. I know. That's what he said. That's why I like it. Um, so let me just go back just a, a few steps. Uh, I came from a different time, I think, in the legislature. And I really want to go back to this thing. Uh, Jody and I, uh, our former governor, and um, uh, we had a, a, a really really good relationship that we could talk to people we don't, didn't always agree. Uh, but I wanna tell you a story about, I was chairman of the education committee, uh, the Democrat and chairman of it. And um, the ranking member was Paul Kinnear, uh, who was a fantastic young man. He was a Republican and, and uh, was a judge of probate and all that kind of stuff. And, and um, I, I wanna tell you what we used to do we would talk and we know what the bills would come out. And Paul would say to me, you know, I'm not voting for this bill because it was different points of view. And I said, okay. And he said, but this is what I'm gonna say, Nancy, on the floor of the house. And I said, okay, Paul, this is what I will say to your point of view on the, on the floor of the house. And uh, we did. And then we went out to, Oh, I shouldn't tell some of the too young, uh, the offices club where they, they serve something like alcohol or something, uh, but we'd go together. And we always, many, uh, many of my friends on the other side of the aisle, were, we were always honest uh, about what we were going to say on the floor of the house or in a committee room or whatever. And I will tell you, Paul Kinnear stopped me in the middle of a public hearing and there was Democrats from Meriden. And I'm yelling at them because of chairman of, of education, they didn't want to do uh, breakfast for kids. And I just didn't think that was right. So I just opened my mouth to the people that were, and I was running for, uh, I was running for a uh, controller at that time. And I just thought they were wrong. And so Paul came over to, he told me, he said, you know, they're Democrats and you're going after them. And I said, I don't care. And the, the, the fun part of that was is that Paul cared that I was doing, knew, wanted me to know what, was, what, what it meant. And it didn't mean anything if you don't stand up for what you believe in, be a Democrat or Republican. I don't really care. If you don't stand up for what you believe in, then don't get into public life. If you can't speak what you believe in and fight for what you believe in, then get out of public life. You might not always agree with your best friends, but you can stand up and teach people to stand up and talk for what is good for all, all people. It doesn't matter your color of skin, doesn't matter what party you belong to, doesn't matter where you come from. It's about us as human beings, as, as for what we want our children to grow up in and, and have the ability to speak out. And as I said before, your word is your bond and you better stick to that. Thank you, Jody. Thank you. Definitely that respect and that, that conversation ahead of time so that you could have that debate flowing back and forth and respectfully, um, you know, bring your points up to one another is an important lesson. Um, Brenda, um, talk a little bit about, um, you know, how young folks can get involved in politics. Not everyone sees themselves as a politician. There are some other things that they can do to get involved. 
So I hate that word politician and I, it's become like an ugly word. And I, 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 I try to tell young people, you know, politician, it's like the art, the possible. Um, but for some reason it's been changed over the years. So public service, right? So um, I think we, we attract a lot of good young people already. Um, young people have reached out to me over the years as I've run for office, um, just because they said they read something I did or some bill I worked on or something I cared about over the years and asked to be involved to help me. Um, and I think it's happened probably to all the women on, on this panel who've run for office. Um, I think we want to engage young people in, I think it's an interesting um, experience for any young person to work on a campaign, whether they like politics or not. I think it's just an interesting uh, idea. I was saying to my uh, son the other day, I was talking about my experience in Hartford and I said to him, you know, I think that every single person in Connecticut should have to mandatorily serve one year in the legislature. <laughs> I mean, one term. And because I just think it would be such an, an amazing experience for every resident in our state just to understand how complicated uh, government can be and how bureaucratic it can be and how much work, pe well, some people put in <laughs> to, do the, to do the job. And so I, I want to attract young people. I think it's just an interesting experience. And so I do my best to encourage young people who reach out to me all the time. And to be honest, uh, I have Democrat uh, young people and Republican young people and unaffiliated young people who reach out to me just because they like my message or they want to be uh, learn some, some information from me. And I think it's just a great experience for any young person. And I think we can all encourage that. And as uh, Themis was saying, you know, instead of putting the programs together, because sometimes programs don't really attract people, um, being present, you know? I mean, young girls looked to Governor Rell when she was governor. I mean, they saw her on television. They saw her, they, they, they saw this woman who, they, who was lovely and kind and, and felt approachable. And, they want, and, and that inspired young women to get involved, right? Just seeing her uh, or seeing her work. And the same thing with Themis, you know, a, a, a very strong woman who, who just was speaking on a panel, they saw her on the news or they saw her speaking in a YouTube video on, on the floor of the house fighting for something. And they thought, wow, I really care about that. She's cool. I want to do that or I want to learn more about it. So I think being approachable, going out and, and, and talking to young children, which I actually think is like the best part of public service is spending some time in schools. I think we should all do it once a week. We do it on Zoom now but just talking to young kids like I did today with the brownies and those girls looking at me with those eyes, I could see it. And they were, they were, I, they were inspired to see a woman. And they said to me, do you sleep here for a select woman? And what do you do? And they're like so cute and excited. And just that little interaction. Okay. With these kids for a half an hour at the end of the day will inspire them in some way, shape or form. And I think that's really the best program any of us can participate in is just spending a little time with our young people, talking to them and engaging with them. I would agree. I think that it's a very important thing for all of us to be able to open those doors and make those connections. As some of you students will understand internships and those networking connections that you can make, even with any of the folks here on the panel tonight will be invaluable as you grow up and learn to do whatever it is that you're studying and wanna get into. Um, as we round out the, uh, the panel discussion, um, Secretary McCaw, you know, we're here celebrating 100 years of the right for women to vote. And a good question that was uh, sent in was, you know, what do you wish for, for young ladies over the next 50 years? What, what can they look forward to? What are some of the milestones that you might be um, hoping for their future? Well, that's, that's, that's a great question. Um, you know, as a as a woman of color, I I just have to say that um, I wish to see more progress, and I think this year, um, seeing Kamala Harris, Vice President Elect Kamala Harris, um, make history um, is incredible. But um, what comes with that is not just seeing more representation, but a strong, competent woman of high caliber. And so for me as a, as a, um, as a leader who's also a woman of color, 
Um, that is what I hope for our nation um, is that we begin to break down some barriers. Um, and I'm sure that as, as a vice president elect leads and the people watch her lead, um, I know that young girls will have a spark as um, first select woman talked about what she saw in the eyes of those children, she lit a spark today. Um, and so for our nation, in light of some of the, uh, the challenges and some of the, the fight across the nation, um, I would like to see progress. And I'm a firm believer that no matter what walk of life you come from with determination and hard work, that one can pull themselves up by their bootstraps and that they could you know, succeed and, and, and progress beyond the past generation. And so um, those, those are the types of uh, stories when I look back, I hope that you know, my children will be telling their children about how people of color progressed. And it's not always the progress because it was a handout, but because we worked for it. We work for it and we're competent and we're equal and we're not afraid. Um, and so um, I think we're in a very important time and that we ought to be taking note because if anywhere, it's here in America that you can achieve your dreams and that you can crash the ceilings. And so for me, I wanna see our people progress further and they have it within them. They gotta have the will, the tools are here and they have leaders that are leading by example. And so that's, you know, that's what I'm hoping for um, for our future. Thank you very much. Uh, Themis, did you want to close out by maybe giving one of your thoughts for what you expect for the next 50 years for these young ladies and men too who are watching? Well, at first, let me thank Governor Rell for doing what she's been doing um, with the University of Hartford. I think, I think things like this, events like this, going into schools, whether they're younger kids or college, or college girls, so they can see and have these conversations with us directly I think those are the things we need to do more of. And clearly, I mean, the amount of women in the Connecticut legislature now are less than there were when I got elected. And that is, you know, for a lot of the reasons we spoke about earlier, but I think that we will, it will continue, women will continue to be treated more equally. And women will continue, you know, to run for office more often. And, but it's not moving fast enough, I think. Whether it's women, whether it's, you know, as Melissa mentioned, women of color, um, we still have a struggle. We still have to work harder to get the same recognition as a man. We still have to work harder to be taken as seriously as a man. Um, and, you know, the, the interesting thing that was said earlier is one of the attributes that people look for for women is, is attractiveness. You know, I mean, I will say this, the things that are your strengths are also your weaknesses, right? So certain, certain things can get your foot in the door, but then it may make you struggle a little bit more. So I would say use anything that you believe is in your toolbox to your advantage, but recognize you're going to have to fight a little more. And I think that what we can expect for the next 50 years, it will be very positive as long as we all take it seriously. I mean, even some of the young women that are on now watching or the older women that are watching, I mean, I, I encourage you and challenge everybody to go out tomorrow. And kind of, I know it's hard now with schools and, and all of this it makes it difficult for all of us in, in public office because we can't see people as much. We can't do what we do uh, best, but call one of your schools, call one of your Brownie troops or your Girl Scout troops, call some girls organization and say, listen, I'd love to come in and talk to you. I'd love to set up a Zoom call. Like if every one of us does that tomorrow, that's hundreds and hundreds of young girls that will have the ability to see what we do and understand they can do it too. You know, and I think we all have to stay on top of that. If we do, we're going to have a great 50 years. It's a quite uh, an easy challenge that I think we can all certainly achieve. Thank you so much. Governor Rell, did you want to take a moment just to say anything before we close out? You don't know how difficult it is just to be opening and sort of closing because I'm listening to these wonderful women talk and share their experience. And I'm thinking to myself, oh, I wanna jump in there. I wanna say something here. So it's a good thing that I wasn't doing that tonight. But um, first I wanna say thank you to you, Jody, because it, you know having you as a moderator has helped us go along nice and smooth and I really appreciate that. But I think too that we as women, um, 
you know, I, there's so many things that were said tonight. Women do have to stand up for themselves. They have to speak up. They have to be willing to participate. Sometimes we take that back seat just a little bit because we're timid, we're a little shy. We sometimes have more self-doubt than we should. And I forget who it was, maybe Nancy that said earlier, when I got involved, I didn't know anything about politics. Nancy, I was the same way. And by the way, she tells you she's the oldest. She's only older than me by a couple of months. So she's not really that old. But anyway, it's just, it's amazing to me how far we've come, but yet how far we have to go. But I think if we encourage more women, help them, you know, when you're making those decisions, yes, we think about family. What are we going to do? Who's going to take care of the children? One of the things that I was very lucky about when I ran for state office for state representative, I had a supportive husband, somebody that was going to be there when the kids got home from school, that kind of thing. And you need that support, whether it's a husband or just, you know, your mother or your mother-in-law or somebody that will help you. Those things are important. But we need to encourage women by saying, I did it. I made it work. You can do it too. So very true. Well, I want to thank everybody for joining us tonight. And thank you uh, to the gentlemen who are being so patient and kind to listen to all of us women speak tonight. Uh, I know that's not an easy thing to do, but thank you. Um, and we also wanted to just uh, round out by letting you know that the Governor Jody Ralph Center for Public Service was established at the University of Hartford in 2011 and its purpose of promoting the values of integrity in government and public service and responsible participation in public life. The center's mission is to provide a community and academic forum for the discussion of ethics in government, the importance of civil discourse in politics, citizens' involvement in public service and government. And we also want to thank, especially to our co-sponsor, the Governor William A. O'Neill, Endowed Chair in Public Policy and Practical Politics of Central Connecticut State University. Thank you to everybody who participated tonight and listened in and shared your questions and to our panel and to Governor Rell. Thank you all so much and everybody stay safe and have a great night.